Well, thank you very much, Jackie, Your Highness, Minister. That was a very inspiring talk, and uh, it's a terrific segue into what I'm going to try and say, so thank you very much. And Nobel laureates and, and friends, it's, it's my great pleasure to be here. I have only uh, 20 minutes, and I know that our timekeeper is quite ferocious, so I'm going to get straight into it. Reconnecting to the Biosphere was the paper that Carl Falke has led, a group of authors to write as a much more expanded background version. And uh, I want to move quite quickly into it, but I want to begin with the problem that we're trying to face, which is in a nutshell here. And the first part is that in this century, the world has to provide for, actually it's about nine billion, I think the UN is, is uh, agreeing on at the moment, um, which we will have by about two, 2050. And they've got to do that without destroying the natural capital that they depend on. There is a grave danger of a long nightfall if we fail. And these five forces of climate change, disease, famine, migration, and state failure, they have the things that in the past have triggered long dark ages in humanity and in civilization, and all five are active now. So the question is, can our unprecedented information and technology that we can use, coupled with the transformation in governance and in human behavior, provide a solution in time before we reach that long nightfall. Why do we entitle this reconnecting? Because we've always been connected. Before this globalized era, we knew we were connected because we operated at scales at which we lived and the connections made us very aware of them. But those connections are actually stronger now than ever, but they're hidden and we're losing that recognition because of the remoteness of the effects, the global scale and pace of developments, and an overwhelming focus on economic growth. And for these reasons, we have tended to lose this recognition of just how connected we are to the biosphere. Here's just a quick example. This is of Thailand shrimp production. And we all eat Thailand shrimps somewhere. And in 1988, they got their food in the forms of fish products to feed the shrimps from Japan. And if you go through 1990 to 95 to 2000, the world fisheries are now supplying massively amounts of tons of fish food to create shrimps in Thailand, which then get re-exported all around the world. <coughs> and those connections have consequences. So what are the consequences of connectedness? And the main one is that the world is a self-organizing or self-regulating system within limits. And those limits are expressed as threshold effects. Beyond a threshold, the internal dynamics of a system, the way it functions, change. It functions differently. It still self-organizes, but it self-organizes along a different pathway. And these threshold effects then highlight the importance of resilience, which is basically the amount of disturbance that a system can experience without crossing a threshold. And the closer that a system gets to a threshold, the smaller the shock that's needed to shift it across that threshold. Here's just a quick example of coral reefs. <coughs> and this is some very good work done by colleagues on the Great Barrier Reef, but also looking at the coral uh, in the Caribbean and East African. And all over the world, coral reefs can exist in, in a number of different states. That's the one they all love, the coral reef state, a macroalgal one, sea urchins, barrens, slime at the extreme. The drivers of change on coral reefs are fishing pressure and external nutrients, runoff from the land, fertilizer from agriculture. And as you increase these two drivers, the system can cope with it up to this boundary. And once you go across that boundary, you're in a macroalgal, it flips. It's no longer coral dominated, far fewer fish and all the rest of it. And the important thing is that you can cross that one, but you can't come back that way. Even if you take the fishing pressure off and you stop the fertilizer, it stays in a macroalgal state. And that's the alternate state that it self-organizes in now. 
You can get it back with a whole lot of extra stuff, but I won't go into that. And the important thing is that these, these threshold positions are not fixed. They depend on what's happening in the rest of the world around you. And climate change, for example, will bring those thresholds in. So as climate change occurs, coral reefs will be able to tolerate less fishing pressure and less nutrients before they flip into an alternate state. Most of the Caribbean coral reefs are now no longer coral reefs. They're some form of slime, macroalgae, and barrens. <clears throat> so the formal definition of resilience is this. It's the capacity to absorb a disturbance and then reorganize so that it retains essentially the same function, structure, and feedbacks, to have the same identity. A coral reef with corals is not the same identity as a slime-based mold. And the, the notion of identity is very strong in resilience in psychology, where people's identity shifts. And uh, we'll come back to that a bit more, I'm sure, in discussion. But the important word I want to focus on here is feedbacks. In the Resilience Alliance, which I've been involved in, we've now got about 100 published accounts of threshold where people have done the research and published it. And for all those where there's enough information to really get at it, every case of a threshold is associated with a change in a critical feedback. So changing a feedback, or the level of a feedback, or whatever it is, causes the threshold. And it's worth spending a bit of time on this because people don't, often don't understand it. This is a, an arid rangeland, something I'm familiar with, but all over the world, it's a very simple system, and I want to just show you the feedbacks. Rain creates soil water, which gets taken up by grass, gets eaten by livestock, and people use that, and the reverse effects, livestock reduce the amount of grass, and goes back to fit, take soil water. But this arrow here says there's an effect of changing grass on how much rain gets into the soil, because this is the rainwater infiltration rate it's about tenfold difference as you increase grass cover. And the important thing here is that there's a threshold level. And on this side of the threshold, the system self-organizes in that direction. It increases in grass. Once you're on that side, more water runs off than goes in, and the system gets progressively less grass and becomes desertified. So that's a threshold where the system moves in that direction or that direction, depending on where you are on either side of that threshold. So that is a critical feedback for desertification. And it changes as the amount of grass changes. That's what I mean by changing feedback. And we've got to think about feedbacks. And thresholds occur often on slowly changing variables. They're the, in the desertification one, it's the amount of grass cover is the slow controlling variable with a feedback change on it that we, we know about that one. So how many others are there? And they occur often called tipping points in social systems. Critical mass is another word. And they occur in both biophysical and social. So in economic systems, it's the debt to income ratio is a, is a slowly changing variable that has a threshold on it. Riot behavior in crowds, a very well-known paper by Granovetter on threshold models of collective behavior. So these occur in social and in biophysical. I would ask, what are the slow variables that have recently reached threshold levels in the Middle East? Because that's what's happened. I'm not sure what they are, but probably quite complex. Now, resilience is a conceptual framework then, and it involves these three concepts. Specified resilience and thresholds, which we've been talking about. General resilience, or adaptability, how you manage that really. And transformation, which is all about transformability in a system. Making a system very resilient in a specific way, this is to avoid a particular threshold or something, can cause it to lose resilience in other ways or at other scales. If you try and keep a system constant, preventing disturbance, it erodes resilience. So a forest from which you always exclude fire eventually loses its capacity to tolerate fire. 
it becomes non-resilient to fire. The only way you can make a forest resilient to fire is to burn it every now and then. And this is the thing about resilience. The only way you keep kids resilient is to let them play in the dirt every now and then. And so this sort of problem, it's unintended consequences of trying to do what you think the good thing is that leads to erosion of resilience. So because of that, because we'll never know all the thresholds that you need to manage, we have to think about general resilience. That's the capacity to cope in all kinds of ways with all kinds of shocks, not specified. So what attributes confer resilience in general? And this list is by no means complete. It's a kind of an amalgam out of a, a number of studies that have been done that we've sort of put together. But diversity, beware of removing redundancies because often they're not really redundancies. They're actually um, what we call response diversity in the system. Being modular in structure and not overly connected, having tight feedbacks, responding quickly to change, being open, having reserves like seed banks in an ecosystem or memory in society, having polycentric and adaptive governance rather than rigid, top-down, one-size-fits-all type governance. Those things make a system generally resilient. Most losses in resilience are unintended consequences of narrowly focused optimization. And correcting this requires a transformational change in how we use and account for natural capital. And particularly, it means including ecosystem goods and services as a standard accounting practice in all sectors of the global economy. And we can build on positive things. This is not all bad news. TEEB, PEX, RED+, Plus, I won't spell them out. Most of you are familiar with these international developments are all positive in that direction of, of doing this. But, and I love the word you used, Minister, about coalitions of forerunners. I think that's a lovely phrase, and I'm going to take that back to Australia because we need to join that coalition. And this, this is being led by coalitions of forerunners, and it will gradually spread, and I think that's really important. But in adapting to past problems, we've locked in some dysfunctional systems. The poverty traps in many parts of the world our global agricultural food supply system is fa it's failing to feed 7 billion now and it's degrading the capacity to produce it. So it's a dysfunctional system when you think of it. Our failure to address climate change. Social economic well-being being based on resource consumption is a dysfunctional system. So we have locked in some dysfunctional systems. And then that says really as Johan pointed out yesterday, one of my favorite quotes, but it's digging the hole deeper. And the first rule of hole says, when you're in it, stop digging that hole deeper. Well, how do we stop doing that? To meet these challenges without crossing critical boundaries is going to require transformation, not just a little bit of more adapting. We can't keep doing the same thing. This is transformation of worldviews, of institutions, and of approaches to resource use. And I'm going to use that equation because we discussed it yesterday and people didn't like this IPAT equation. It's actually a, it's a well-known one. That impact is equal to population times affluence of some way and technology. But we need to have a necessary transformation to turn that from being negative into positive. And how would we do that? Well, I'm not sure exactly, but one way would be to put the focus on population on a developing world as assistance and female education. Now we know that the single best correlate of population increase or decrease is the level of education of females. And so instead of just saying that's a problem and not to go and say to people, you've got to reduce your population, there is a positive thing that you might be able to do in that respect. Affluence we need to actually transform A to W. Instead of being acquiring an acquisition as a function of affluence, this needs to become some function of well-being as our aspiration. Human aspiration at the moment is to acquire. There was a lovely phrase yesterday, I don't know if it was Ashok, where someone mentioned the media has changed wants into needs. 
and we think we actually need these things. We don't, we just want them. Well, if we can change that aspiration to human well-being, so that's what people competed for and strived for. And the technology, well, if the focus of technology and innovation was on achieving these sorts of things without secondary effects, that would be a useful way of doing innovation and technology. Okay, so I've done that to say that I think we have to get into this is the definition of transformability because without that we can't do it. And that's the capacity to become a fundamentally different system when ecological or social or other conditions make the existing one untenable. And I want to make the point that resilience and transformation are not opposites. It's not that you've either got to be resilient or you've got to transform. Maintaining resilience at one scale can require transformational changes at other scales. Maintaining the resilience at the global scale is going to require transformational changes in many subsections and subparts of the world as well, as well at the, as at the global. So what are the determinants of transformability? I've given you what they were of general resilience a bit. Well, the first one is the preparedness to change, getting beyond the state of denial. We don't have to really change. We can just tweak this a bit and do that and keep doing the same thing. Transformability is getting beyond that state of denial. The second is options for change. And those emerge from a lot of support for innovation and experiments and novelty, usually at smaller scales. Transforming the whole of a country or a, a, a region in one go is of, too dangerous and too expensive and difficult. And, but you can transform at low scales and collectively turn to transformation at a higher scale. So it, all of this innovation usually takes place at small scales and you need lots more support for that. I argue that in my own country, we have a lot of subsidies not to change instead of subsidies to change. It's not that you have to stop helping people. You've just got to help them in a different way. And the third determinant is the capacity to change. And that really depends on the levels of all the capitals, including social capital, leadership and trust and all of those things, but as well as how much natural capital and how much infrastructure and other capitals and governance, and I put that in bold, because at present we lack the global governance that's necessary for achieving the required transformations. I'll give you one example of which I find fascinating. This comes from work out of the Stockholm Resilience Center, and it's about illegal overfishing in the Southern Ocean, and I've been involved in that myself in this Camelot thing some time ago. This convention puts pressure on nations and it provides enforcement measures to stop illegal fishing in the Southern Ocean. And this picture is really interesting because if you look here, this is the amount of illegal fishing that was going on in the mid-90s. And these were the nations that were involved in doing it. And Camelot put pressure on them. And so by the sort of early 2000s, those nations had changed to the same fishing vessels, but they're switching flags but the other countries have now given in, and it's now these nations. And then, by the time you get to around about now, it's a different set of nations. But note that the amount of illegal fishing has actually declined, but it's not perfect, because we don't have a really, really good governance system yet. But that's the kind of problem we're dealing with. So the governance problem is global scale shocks are looming. We've got all of these things happening as we approach the boundaries, and in the face of this, Governance efforts fail to confront. They perform in silos, leading to partial solutions. WTO deals with trade. The World Health Organization deals with health. FAO deals with agriculture. They perform in silos with their own objectives. And it's the feedbacks between them that can lead to threshold effects. The silo behavior of international agencies and strong national self-interest, they mask the global feedbacks effects. This picture came out of a paper that we did here in the Bayer Institute a couple of years ago. Scott Barrett back there was a key person in helping us do it. These were the global drivers of, of what, what is changing the world. And these drivers are causing unwanted outcomes in climates and ecosystems and health and economics 
And we look, you won't read them all, that's global warming, sea level rise, climate refugees, ocean acidification, financial market shocks. These are the unwanted outcomes caused by these drivers. It's these. Feed, nobody deals with them. Those are the inconvenient feedbacks that are not really being addressed adequately because we lack global governance to do it. So we need a new social contract for global sustainability. Once we've got beyond the state of denial, such a transformation would, we propose, be a rejuvenating era for us, providing innovating opportunities for new ventures all over the world. Thank you.